in the series Forward, and today I'm going to talk to you about defeating fear and discouragement, two of, uh, I think they're two of the most uh, prevalent uh, tactics that the enemy uses to uh, bring us down, fear and discouragement. And I think a lot of it is associated with the way we think about those things. So I'm going to try to give you some tools to defeat fear and discouragement. And as you practice them, I know God will speak uh, victory into your life. The life that we live or the life that we uh, have is often a reflection of the thoughts we think. Something comes into your mind, it typically comes out in your life. These are, by the way, all thoughts that we have talked about in the last couple of weeks. You cannot have a positive life with a negative mind. If you're inundated with negativity, it's going to come out in a negative life. You can't think negatively and expect to have positive results in your life. And this is all, I, I, I just want to assure you, you can read it in the scriptures as we go along, but very uh, scriptural, biblically-based messages. Why? Because the Bible says a lot about how we think. And uh, what I really have discovered as I've studied Paul a bit is he has a lot to say about the mind. And you do good just to spend some time in the Pauline writings and you would discover that uh, what we think does matter. Most of our battles, most of the, the battles that we have are fought and won in the mind. I believe it's the greatest battlefield that we all face. And we talked about identifying uh, the, the, that stronghold in your life that you'd like to pull down. Just pick one to start with. And as you do that, God will work powerfully in your life. And he gives you some scripture to kind of uh, to cement those things around. We talked about pulling out promises from the word of God that apply to us and using them to replace a lie with the truth or defeat a lie with the truth. As we think on those things, we create uh, pathways in our mind that make it easier to think that way going forward. So name the truth that demolishes the stronghold. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we talked about how the weapons we fight with are not weapons of this world, but they have divine power to the pulling down of strongholds and false arguments that set themselves up against God. We talked about putting those thoughts to the tip of the spear, making them obedient, subservient to Christ. As you do that, you gain victory in your life. And there's many things that uh, folks struggle with. I know for me personally, uh, there was a, a lot of years spent in insecurities and inferiority thought processes that sometimes diminished my ability to do something for God because I got stuck on what, I, what I'm not capable of. And Remember, when God is in you, he's made you more than a conqueror. He's given you the power through the Holy Spirit to accomplish these things. He's not asking you to do it all by yourself. He's asking you to work with him to make this happen in your life. Then we talked about the principle of write it, think it, confess it until you believe it. And we talked about how Paul said, think on important things. Think on uh, noble things, right things, pure things, lovely things, whatever's admirable. He says, think on these things. And the things that you learn through uh, studying the scriptures and getting closer to God, as you do this, you're, you're creating a new way of thinking. And it will ultimately lead you uh, down a pathway of success and I don't use success in the way that a lot of people use success. Because remember, faithfulness is one of the primary ways that God judges our success. But God does want you to have success. He does want you to be fruitful. He does want you to multiply. He does want to see you advance the kingdom. This is not about you just getting by in life. He wants you to be more than that, do more than that. So we create new ways of thinking, and it gets easier to think that way as we go through life. Uh, today, I want to talk to you for a few moments about 
and again, I'm not a neurologist. I'm not, uh, I haven't been educated in the brain in this sense, but I, I think there are some things we can talk about that kind of cross-pollinate between uh, what we know about the brain and what the Bible teaches about our bodies and our minds. And uh, there's a thing called cognitive biases or uh, mental filters. You ever wonder why, how two people can experience the same thing and have total opposite reactions to those things? Like, for instance, somebody might visit a church. And I've, I, I promise you, I've heard this in the same Sunday, same week, uh, right after service, oftentimes out in the foyer, I've had uh, uh, people come up to me and say, that service was powerful, and God really spoke to me, and he moved on my life. And then, uh, uh, you know, by Monday, I have an email waiting for me by, from somebody. In fact, uh, I remember this uh, happened uh, some years ago now, uh, where somebody was visiting from Australia, and they came into our service, and and one person uh, visiting earlier was all like, this was great, God, God's blessing is here, and this church is so friendly, and uh, God spoke to me through the message. And then this, this other dude from Australia comes in, uh, writes in the email, the church is so, it's, it's faith, there's no friendliness, and I'm sitting here going, how can it be both? Well, it, it's, in a sense, it is both. Because uh, both people approached it with a different filter or a different bias. They come, they come in their uh, church with a mindset, and it affects how they filter things. And oftentimes when uh, I approach things and I start off, before, before I even get there and I'm talking to myself, telling myself, this is not going to be fun, or this is going to be this. How many of you have ever done that? You, 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 you're, you're just totally struggling with, I, I don't look forward to this. It's gonna, not going to be fun at all. And it's going to blah, 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 blah. And usually, you fulfill what you think. You go there because your attitude is not great. You're seeing everything that's wrong. You don't see anything that's good or anything that's positive. And, and many people live their lives with those filters on their brain so they, they really can't come into an environment and enjoy it because they come in with preconceived ideas. These biases, in, in these biases, we mistake in reasoning based on a personal experiences or preferences. Uh, some people grew up ar around abusive men, so they don't trust men. Uh, some uh, grew up with maybe a father uh, figure that wasn't uh, very encouraging, and you end up uh, uh, struggling with trusting uh, uh, not just fathers in general, but even your heavenly father, because you perceive that that's how God is going to treat you, because that's your example. Some people grew up uh, believing that rich people are bad, and well, there, it might be true there's some rich people who are maybe uh, not good people. Uh, they're there probably are some people out there who are rich who are very nice people. And or some people think if they're rich, they must have done something uh, ungodly to get there, as though God doesn't give us the ability to produce wealth and uh, as though God's people don't experience uh, abundance in God. So we all have filters and they shape how we see life. They really do. And you begin to pre-wire yourself for how you interpret events, how you interpret things in general when you're walking through life. And if you ever notice, some, sometimes uh, this is an area of my life that I'm very interested in. I, I, wanna, f I wanna change the filter uh, of how I see things like either positively or negatively. If, you, if you're conditioned to always see the negative, and by the, by the way, that's not hard. It's, it's so easy to see the shortcomings, especially in other people. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? You, 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 sometimes you meet people and you see immediately all the things that you don't like about that person or how they do things. Or, it's so easy. And it's, it, as you uh, 
use that filter more and more, it becomes just a part of life. Everything you see, you always see the negative. You don't ever see the positive in it. But I want to challenge you because I think that this, this is not a, a series or a sermon about positive thinking outside of God and His Word. But I think God is a lot more positive than sometimes we as a church depict Him as. We have painted God to people as often a mean, well, let me just say it this way. If your filter is primarily the holiness of God, often you will begin to become judgmental if you live there and focus there and you stay there all the time. How do I know? Because I've done that. You, you begin to look at people and their, their shortcomings, and instead of bringing grace to bear on a situation, you're bringing judgment to bear. And I, I, I'm wholeheartedly, 100% engaged, enjoy uh, talking about the holiness of God, spending time uh, in God's presence. But holiness is not gained by do's and don'ts, a list of things that you don't do and a list of things you do you're supposed to do right. It's about relationship with Jesus. You can't even fulfill the righteous requirements of the law. You can't stand before God in your own holy. You can't be holy like he's holy by just not doing certain things and doing other things. Those things happen out of relationship with him. It's not out of rules. I think it would be a mistake to write down a list of rules and here are things and this is how you become holy. That's not what the scriptures teach. I know some automatically go, what about the Ten Commandments? God wrote those down. He, he did. And Jesus said, I, I fulfilled all of that. So knowing Jesus and spending time with him, being in relationship with him, he's the one who brings you into holiness. So uh, we're going to talk about this. You can, you, we don't want to... Uh, uh, fall into the trap that we don't need to change the way we think about things. We don't want to fall in the trap that our filters are the best filters or our filters are the only filters because that's just not accurate. And oftentimes I find the Lord encourages me through interaction with other people. And when I get into relationship with them, I discover, oh, I, I could probably work on that right there. Or something they do uh, will make me thankful that maybe, maybe God has worked in me in that area. He encourages me along. So uh, how do we deal with uh, circumstances or situations? Because there are some where, where people approach uh, uh, circumstances or situations and they have two totally different uh, views on what should happen. Probably one of the greatest happened in the Old Testament. Uh, God didn't ask Moses to do this, but the people insisted on uh, uh, going in and surveying the land that God had promised them. And I think probably any person who's sitting around thinking about what is a good strategy if God has promised us this land, let's go check it out a little bit. Let's see what's there. Let's see what we're going to face when we go there. Right? Logically, it sounds right. Let's just go and check it out. Before we just begin to march into the land, let's make sure that uh, we know what we're facing. So in Numbers chapter 13 and 14, you see where uh, there, there's spies that are sent out, 12 spies. And they go and they're looking uh, at this beautiful, uh, prosperous land that God promised them. He said the land flowing with milk and honey. And they come back and they have reports and they, they're skewed. Ten of them come back and they're afraid. Why are they afraid? Because they saw... Uh, giants in the land. In fact, they said, we look like grasshopper in their eyes, and we also, probably in our own eyes, you, you begin to look at yourself as inferior, insufficient to the task before you. you. You begin to be moved by fear. Instead of the knowledge that God said this land is ours, and he's going to give it to us, we 
we're focused on the obstacles that are in the way. And you've heard people say this. Some look and see the obstacles. Others look at the obstacles and see opportunities. And two of the men that went were like Joshua and Caleb were like, no, we can take this land. This land is ours. And all the things that they said on both sides were, were factual except for how they perceived what they saw. How many times... Uh, I, I think in my own life, I've been in front of a decision and I weigh out things. I, I really like to have all the information I can gather at one, as much as I can before I make a decision. The, the problem is, is sometimes uh, you, you got to make a decision relatively quickly and you got to have some sort of uh, ability to gauge what you see and make a reasonable decision off of it. And I, I just want to take all of the uh, possibilities and answer all of them before I make a decision. And that's just not how God operates sometimes. You ever had God have you stand in front of something and he's asking you to accomplish something for him? And you're going, uh, Lord, I don't have enough information. You go, I'm not asking you if you've got enough information. I'm just asking if you're going to be obedient to me and what I ask you to do. These guys, their filters function differently. Two guys were like, yeah, we can do it. Ten were like, oh, we can't do it. And the results were they, they listened to and were overcome by fear associated with the report of, of ten of them that came back and said, we can't do it. And the cost was great, wasn't it? They, they, had, to, they had to have a year for every day they spent in surveying the land, spying out the land. So they got 40 years of wandering and all kinds of stuff that comes with that so we can't say that that if if we're if we are moved by fear that we won't experience some sort of delay in what God wants us to do if you're moved by fear versus faith if you're moved uh, by uh, your insecurities and and the things that have plagued your mind for years you could be stuck that's why we're talking about, from the very beginning, deal with strongholds. Get a hold of them and conquer those things. God's given you the strength and the ability to do it. He's given you the power of the Holy Spirit, which indwells you. You have what you need to overcome those obstacles. All of us do. How come it is some people seem to get through to it and others don't? And I think it's consistency in this area where, where you, 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 change, you change the way you view things. You change your perspective. You reframe what you're seeing. And if you're only focused on one, it, it's like a, a beautiful painting, right? And maybe, maybe it's a sunscape, but there's a dark clouds moving in. And if you frame the photo that, or this painting by, by taking a photo of just the darkness there, you're, you're, you're going to be probably alert, uh, in high, high in, uh, intention, and uh, I got to get in. I mean, if you've been in southern Missouri around some of these storms, when you see clouds rolling in, you're like, oh, my word. And if, if that's all you ever see then you miss the beauty of the sun as it breaks through clouds and maybe it's making way for a, a more beautiful day. And if you only take your frame and you put it on a certain part of the entire painting, you, you will determine kind of where you go from the frame that you put around it. And I think many people do this with life. It's a big picture. It's not the small little uh, frame snapshot you take of maybe the, the difficulties or the challenges you've been in. Uh, if, you, if you look at those in the light of how big God is, if you frame it around God's power and God's might and around how good God is, you can change the way that you function in life. But if, you, if you're constantly focused on a defeated mentality and every time you look at some challenge, all you see is defeat, then you're probably not going to break through and move forward in a positive way. You can have the same facts that I have, but I, I may look at, they may be framed in a more positive way then maybe you do, and we can be looking at the same set of facts and, and, and arrive at different conclusions by the way that we frame it. 
And I'm trying to encourage you today that we look at things in a different way, that you start allowing God to work on your mind and how you frame things, because how you frame them determines how you see them. I was thinking of this. You can't control what happens to you. You can't control it. But you can control how you frame it. You can control how you respond. Now, I was thinking of this in Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. Now, this is in the NWV. This is the new whiner's version. I just I had to be really out there with it because otherwise somebody would go out here and say, Pastor Chris, what was that version again? NWV? It says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me really stinks. As a result of the hell I've been going through, I'm quitting my apostleship and never going back to church. Isn't that really how uh, often human beings frame things? Like when difficult things and challenges happen, even in a church context, you know, uh, it, 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 we're human beings. We all mess up. We all blow it. Hello? You, you with me on this? I, I know it's coming, so I'm starting to get excited. <laughs> like, like th- this is just reality. Wherever there's more than one person, and even then there's, there's potential for conflict, most of the time internally. But whenever you get more than one person together, uh, this is why we're encouraged so much to, to, to frame our relationships in church by being humble and considering others before ourselves, because it's too easy to come into church and look at people and to want to just go, go off. You're like, you're about to see the real me. Well, no, that wouldn't be a good thing. What, what Paul really said is, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. I mean, he could have looked at it. Paul could have had the, 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 the new whiner's version approach. Could have. I mean, he could have walked around, I'm always in prison. He could have looked at all the negative, but even, even before Paul started, he was told what he was going to go through and suffer for God, and he laid out a list of stuff that he's been through, and he struggled, but, but he, he looks at the situation he's in, he says, listen, uh, uh, the, the reality is, is there's a whole bunch of uh, guards who are, who are hearing me, Right? Who are, who are captive audiences, you might look at it like Paul was in prison. Prison, like, actually, they're, they're, have, they're having to listen to me every time they come around me. They're guarded by me. They're going to hear the gospel. They're going to hear about Jesus. How many of you, if you were stuck in a prison for preaching the gospel, would find it easy or or find it as just a natural part of your life of finding the positive behind what you're going through. That, that you're, you're realizing that, hey, I might be inside four walls and I can't necessarily get out, but, but I'm going to make the best of this and I'm going to share Jesus in here. And you hear about this in countries where pe- the church is being persecuted and they're being, uh, 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 Christians are being sent to jail and they start leading people to Jesus in jail. And uh, I, I remember reading about one of this, uh, the, one of the persecuted church that he, every time they put him in and they made it even more and more difficult on him he just kept winning more and more people to Jesus and finally they said we need to just get this this guy out of just let him go we can't stop him now in some countries they might just kill him but God 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 has a way of showing up in circumstances that are are challenging and maybe even feel a little dark or overwhelming. God has a way of showing up in those situations as we turn our focus towards him and we look to see how we can glorify him in it instead of of complain about it or instead of uh, uh, framing it in our typical uh, uh, maybe Western culture approach to to the gospel. We, we, We want everything to be perfect and without problems. 
Let me just, for the remainder of this message, focus on the man that God used to help Israel move into the promised land. Joshua. In fact, Joshua chapter 1, I'm going to open in my paper Bible. Joshua chapter 1 starts off like this. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses is aid. Moses, my servant is, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all the people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to uh, give them to the Israelites. It says, I will give you every place where you're, uh, you're, you set your foot as I promised Moses. And he goes on to talk about the territory. Uh, let me just pause for a moment and just say this, because this is a pretty significant point. My servant Moses is dead. That, to me, if I'm Joshua, who is a young aide at the time, to Moses as he would uh, go out to the tent of meeting outside. And remember, it says when Moses would leave, uh, uh, Joshua would stay there, indicating that there was something special even in the heart of Joshua that he was interested in staying in the tent of meeting and, and, and enjoying God, trying to maybe practice what he watched his leader do. It says all the, all the people would get that, that, that were there uh, around the tent. Uh, the tent of meeting was outside of town. They, they would see Moses go, and as Moses went, they would begin to worship God in the entrances of their tents. Moses was a great leader, even though he, he often faced conflict with the people that he was called to lead. I have to believe that Joshua saw that. In fact, 40 years had ticked away because they, they followed uh, the wrong advice, the wrong counsel, and they, they decided to listen to the 10 spies who saw the negative in the whole situation instead of the positive. So I'm sitting here thinking, Joshua's got a memory. He's, he, he's got to be struggling with the fact that his, his leader is dead, and now... Uh, God's saying to him, I want you to lead the people that probably, in some respects, caused him a lot of pain. I know this might be too raw, but this is the way it is. Sometimes there's pain in the life of a leader because of the people he's trying to lead or she's trying to lead. And even in that, you're presented with a set of circumstances. How do I respect? How do I respond to that? Do I do I get c cynical as a pastor, as a leader, or, or or you as a leader, or do we soften ourselves before God and say, God, uh, help me uh, pray for and love everybody you send to my care? It's not easy being a leader, but it's also with the Lord on, on your side and helping you, you can do it. So he's faced with some decisions here, and I find it interesting that God has to encourage him. In fact, he says, be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. That's verse number six, and he has to go on and say it again, be strong and courageous. Why do you think God is Joshua is struggling with being strong and courageous. God, uh, you know, uh, Paul says the same thing to Timothy. He says, Timothy, I, God didn't give you a spirit of fear or timidity. Why do you think God's saying that to Timothy? Because probably at some point or another, Paul had learned that Timothy was struggling or that he was facing difficulties and challenges or people were looking down on him because he was young. And he's saying, hey, don't you be afraid. The temptation this morning is when God gives you an assignment or he gives you a challenge or he speaks to you about how you're supposed to live and how you're supposed to uh, uh, walk his plans for your life out, you're going to be faced with a decision to be afraid 
Maybe I don't want to do that. And if I do that, you know, may, I, 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 I'll, I'll, the enemy will attack. How often the enemies use that as a technique to dissuade people from stepping out and trusting God in an area of their lives that he's speaking into? The threat of, of the enemy attacking. You ever been attacked? You, have you ever had a bona fide, real encounter where the enemy is coming at you and it feels like you're hard pressed on every side? You feel like you're going to be crushed under the, the, the burden and the struggle that's before you? I just want to encourage you today that God would say to you, just like he said to Joshua, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. God gave Joshua a threefold mission. He said, lead the people into the promised land, defeat the enemy, and claim the inheritance. That's a big task. No, I, I, I believe Caleb, you know, uh, we say, what, 80 years old at this point, 85 years old? Uh, the reality is, is uh, most would say... Uh, I was ready to do it back then. No, he was coming at it like, let's go. Let's make it happen. And I, I just, I just want to give you uh, four practices that will help you uh, defeat fear and discouragement in your life. And I, I know this, this might be ele elementary stuff. It might be uh, pretty simple, but it's a lot harder to practice, I promise you. And the first would be this, cultivate courage. I, I, I wonder, God, when God says, be strong and courageous, okay, God, how do I do that? If you're telling me to be strong and courageous, what does that mean? Well, this is the good news about uh, uh, what Joshua had experienced. He had seen God do the miraculous, God do the mighty. He had watched God lead the children of Israel. And I, I remember somebody uh, shared one time, uh, like if they were to figure out how much food, how much water, how much stuff it would take to take care of the children of Israel as they uh, uh, wandered through the desert. And it's astronomical, and it was miraculous. And, and what God had been teaching Joshua over time is with God on your side, with God in your heart, with God moving in your life in a powerful way, uh, nothing is impossible to you. You know, that's what the Bible actually says. All things are possible to them that believe. Does that mean all things, or that just means some things? What does that mean, God? I've, I've seen people try to test this theory to, to in, in some ways, in an ignorant way. I told you about that one time. That guy was like, he was in a revival meeting, and he was just, you know, God's, God's on me right now. I, I, I can run right through that wall over there. And before the, he, the pastor, I think it was an evangelist in town, said, could say, no, he took off running. What do you think happened when he met the concrete wall? Down for the count. He wasn't out in the Holy Ghost either. I mean, he was out cold because he, in ignorance, went and ran through. You know, we're not putting God to the test in that kind of stuff. But I want you to be encouraged that God, God wants to help you cultivate a life of courage. That, that just like he kept saying to Joshua, and I think sometimes repetition is really important in this because uh, oftentimes fear is, uh, by the way, fear, its primary purpose is to keep you from doing something. It keeps you crippled, often through overanalyzing, often through, uh, 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 you just sit around and mull over in your head over and over and over again. Remember that filter is now filtering you towards, I can't do this, I can't do this. That's what fear does. It gets you to move away from what God is asking you to do. It paralyzes you. I had this happen uh, early on in my Christian walk. I, I had this uh, experience. I, I, the only way I know to explain it, it was like a really, it was supernatural warfare. I was early in my faith. I, I had a moment where I, I was just very, very aware, aware 
of, of just the enemy. I was new in my faith. I had no idea about anything. I, I, I had no idea even how to defeat this thing in my own, my own life. I was, I was a 19-year-old kid, and I was curled up almost in a fetal position on the bed, and I, I was just crippled by fear. And I was living with a, a Christian family at the time. I, I, uh, uh, they came home late from, they were away all day at an event, and, and I, I, uh, they came home and they found me on the bed, curled up in fear. And it wasn't until they began to show me from God's word different things that I need to understand about God's presence and his power and how the enemy's defeated and, and uh, you, you've got uh, God inside of you and uh, uh, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Uh, the enemy is ultimately powerless to do anything in your life when God's power is evident in your life. And I, I just remember in that context how that little thing taught me something. And uh, it would happen again later on when I was at Bible college. I woke up in the middle of the night just uh, uh, terrorized by fear. And I, I just sent to praying. Sometimes I couldn't even pray out loud. Plus my, my uh, roommate was in the bed over there and I didn't want to well, I thought about waking him up saying, hey, pray with me. I'm really struggling. But I just, I was like, I'm going to win this battle. I'm going to defeat the enemy with, with the help of God and what I know through his word. And, and I begin to do that. And by, by, by the time we hit dawn, it was a few hours of this, God had given me victory. Haven't struggled with it since. You know what a, what, what a new leader needs? And he doesn't need advice. He needs encouragement. Now it's all on Joshua. You understand what I'm saying? To encourage literally means to put heart into. If you want to encourage somebody, it means to make a deposit in their heart. Find the good things, the positive things, the important things, and just pour them in. And God says to Joshua, hey, be strong and courageous. I would say to you today, in your walk with God, in your journey with him, be strong and courageous. I heard somebody say it like this, and it was probably, uh, I remember the, the actual sermon it was in, but the, the idea that the enemy's prowling around like a lion. And the, the Bible uses the word like. And he actually said it, he's more like one of those old lions that have lost its teeth. It was kind of comical to me because I thought about, you know, the times where I've seen people with uh, dentures and they, they come out. I'm not, if you have dentures in there, that's not, it's just, it was a funny thing to me. Somebody's teeth falling out in the middle of a good burger or an apple or something. I don't know. But the enemy, he's like a lion. We serve the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. If you're struggling in your walk with God with fear, God says, be encouraged. Cultivate that in your life. It's too easy to succumb to fear without knowing the tools and the things that are available to you. And by the way, uh, you, you do have to go back to the word of God. Contrary to what some popular preachers and teachers teach today, the word of God is pivotal to overcoming the obstacles in front of you. The second practice is don't make obedience an option. Don't make it an option. If you do, when fear comes, you will give in to fear. If you decide in your heart, no matter what I face, I'm going to obey God. We don't like to talk about obedience, but obedience is key. In fact, God says the, the people who, who don't obey, the people who, who, who rebel against you, Joshua, now this is Old Testament, I understand. He says, I'm going I'm to, they're going to be put to death. 
So this is serious. I mean, following God, being obedient to God, and we also see in the New Testament some practices that God had that we, I'm afraid we wouldn't want to see them uh, in practice in church today, like Ananias and Sapphira. Well, that's New Testament. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God, God is not limited on his options. I'm just saying to you, we need to learn how to follow God in obedience. I read a great book, Forever Ruined on the Ordinary, and it's all about moving into an extraordinary life. And one of the uh, key chapters is about obedience. I've talked to you before about this, but the, you know the idea of instant obedience. They make the point delayed obedience is still disobedience. Like when you tell uh, your child to take out the garbage. I don't, this is not an illustration from my own life. I'm not picking on my kids today, so this is all good. But if you ask your child to do something and you go away and an hour later come back and it's not done, and then maybe, maybe, you, maybe they didn't hear or didn't understand my instructions, so now you make them even more specific. And then you go away and you come back and they're not done. And then you make the statement, and eventually they get up and they do it. In, in that case, delayed obedience is equal to disobedience. God isn't negotiating with us. He is, he is king. He is over everything. And when we want God to do something special in our life, something significant in our life, we've got to be obedient. Obey Him. It says in... Joshua 1, verses 7 and 8, Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, uh, that you may be successful wherever you go. A lot of people want, they want the fruit of effective relationship with God without the obedience. The third, soak up Scripture. Don't, this is really important. The Bible is the roadmap. It's the plan. Just go, keep going back to it. And finally, I want to say to you today, I, the reason I, I've, I've, I've preached on that subject at length, the Word of God. And I've heard, I've heard in recent days, and I, I'm not going to go in, into it, but I've heard some really famous pop culture preachers talk about the word of God as though it's it's in fact he discouraged us from referencing the Bible and I've I've listened to it so many times I, I can't I, I'm like am I misunderstanding this dude and ultimately where it leads to uh, there there was a lecture that he listened to of an atheist talking about how the Bible is just foolish and all this stuff so so in his mind he made up his mind that he wasn't going to reference the Bible anymore he was just going to reference its authors and I, I was like well then then you are redefining what God has actually said from his word he said this this Bible is God breathed his word is God breathed. He carried along men by the Spirit and he recorded and he was faithful to watch over his word and make sure that it was preserved throughout the centuries. Can I say this to you? The word of God is something that you can live by. And as you consume it, it will build courage in your life. It'll build strength in your life. And the last thing is to practice the presence of God. God says... I want you to do this very difficult thing. It's so hard. I'm asking you to take this people and go in and conquer this land. Take its cities. Make them your inhabitants. And, uh, and then he says, he says, I'm going to be with you. And I, I want you to be assured of this today. If you're earnestly seeking to follow God, and you want to live for him, you want, to, you want to do what's right in your life and how he's leading you and how he's directing your life, uh, then you need to know God is with you. He is with you. I have faced 
challenges in my life that I don't understand how I got through it except that God was with me. Maybe he's asked you something difficult. Maybe he's asked you something that seems like, I don't know how I'm going to get this done. There's no way. How could God use me? And God's saying, frame things differently. If you will see what, you're, what, what you face in terms of who's with you, he's walking with you. He's directing your steps. He will get you through. Some of you, you know, you, you're in the fight of your life biggest challenges you'll ever face it may feel like right now or on your doorstep and you're like I don't know how I'm going to overcome this I don't know how I'm going to get through this and God's saying no you will get through it because I'm with you and there's something about knowing that there's something about knowing that God is with me that's going to help you get through I'm just going to pray with you if you don't mind we'll close out our service I I want to encourage you today I want to put something in your heart I feel like the Holy Spirit saying to you I want to pour into you uh, the courage to face the fight in front of you and I believe as we trust God he's going to do just that and sometimes friend don't don't get me wrong sometimes the fight is just obedience Am I going to serve God or not? Am I going to be obedient to him or not? It's not always that there's some great thing in front of me that sometimes it's just, am I going to live for him today on fire, sold out to him? Or am I going to cower back? If I speak up in this situation, everybody's getting, everybody's getting canceled for saying something about this or about that. Am I going to stand up for it? Am I going to stand in, 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 school board meetings and say no we're not going to let this happen in our district or 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 am i going to stand up for the truth of god's word in every circumstance as god is calling me to be bold for him am i going to step out and be bold or am i going to cower back sometimes that's the fight you can do it with him father i praise you i thank you today that you are awesome you are good you are gracious you are powerful you are mighty you're our God nothing nothing can defeat you nothing causes you to wring your hands in heaven nothing absolutely nothing is too difficult for you with you all things are possible when you're in us and working in our lives we can overcome we can conquer we can be everything you call us to be I pray your blessing on us today Move on this church. Move on us as individuals. Help us today to frame our lives in the context that you're always with us. You'll never leave us nor forsake us. Pray your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen.